And coming down the home stretch. That's right. This is the final installment of the bite sized chunks of our five hour live stream. Been cutting into periods of an hour. And this last one is hours four and five. You might notice it's only an hour and a half long. That's because the other hours were just a little bit more. So it's not a perfect division, y'all. But you know what? Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. You might hear me say that somewhere in the live stream. It's a quote on my wall by Mr. Mark Twain. Mark Twain! That's apparently what Steamboat people used to yell out. I think that's where he got the non de plume. Maybe that's a myth. But we're not here to resolve that today. We're here to share the final installment of the replay of the live stream, third annual Overdose Awareness International Observance Day thing that that, that I did. So uh, in this last bit, we're starting out with uh, my friend Teresa, Teresa Saleas from Saleas Counseling, who is uh, here to talk about ART, which incidentally is uh, kind of a, a new wrinkle on some of the EMDR IFS type of work, the rapid trauma response work. And she shares, uh, I didn't know much about it. And so, uh, uh, you know, accelerated recovery therapy is what we're going to talk about. I'd love to know some people who have, who are practitioners of that as well. And especially maybe those who have a, uh, uh, undergone that treatment too. It's got some uh, pretty amazing claims about how quickly it can reduce the crisis response part of your trauma to where you are in a recovery mode and then able to uh, start to process whatever it is else that you want to process and do in therapy. But as far as the panic fight or flight response of trauma, one to three sessions to make a tremendous impact. So you'll hear uh, Teresa is going to talk about that in her experience in use of this and other trauma techniques, which of course ties in with addiction. Joined uh, this this last run also uh, by Valerie Probstfield, who is uh, the host and creator of the Tamam is to Love podcast and a very good friend of the show, former guest, uh, been able to do some trainings with her online and super cool person. And then uh, Isabel Tehran, is the one who joins me to round out and joins me all the way throughout the end of the program. So I hope that in these intro was I haven't missed anybody. There's a lot of comments that people have thrown in as well that you'll hear referenced. And we'll be back to normal programming after this. But thank you so much to everybody who participated and everybody who listened, everybody who is sharing these kinds of things. And if you are aware of people in your life who are at risk for overdose, we all, I mean, theoretically, we are one addiction problem away from a risk of overdose. And those around us, uh, if you wonder if someone around you is struggling with mental health or addiction, as I always say, my answer to that is yes, there are. At the very least, we all have mental health and appreciating and giving back and paying attention and communicating with those around you is one of the biggest ways to do that. So please share awareness and share you know, your own humanity and your own kindness with people. Uh, thanks again for listening. This will see us out of this live replay. And we've got some cool things coming up in September, which I think I mentioned at the end of the broadcast. What a, uh, take a minute to welcome uh, Teresa. Teresa Sale is joining us. Hi. <laughs> good to see you, Dwight. Good to see you too. Another uh, good friend of mine from back in the community mental health days. We're yes. both veterans or survivors, however you want to put it. Those aren't mutually <laughs> exclusive terms of the community <laughs> mental health world. We were just talking about DBT, by the way. Oh, uh, nice. We were both in the DBT group therapist part when we worked uh, uh, at the, the community mental health center. Yes. I just nodded my head towards the literal direction that it is from where I'm sitting, <laughs> just for, that's a little bit of realism for the, the viewers. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you're, you're, you're so kind to join us today. I'm really grateful for you jumping in. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is a topic that is really near and dear to my heart. And I'm so grateful that you're doing this. I think it's a wonderful thing. I did want to thank you though. I was thinking about this and talked about you the other day. I was telling somebody how, me meeting you is what helped me get out on my own and start my own private practice. You ventured out of the community of mental health, and then I shortly after followed after you. So I'm grateful. Oh, for wow. That. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you yes. so much. I really appreciate that. It I, a lot. I appreciate it. 
I will say I've been super impressed by what my, in my opinion is things you've done with your private practice since you left that I have never been able to, or I've never achieved some of the things of building up such a good community resource and team of therapists that you train and, yes. you know, you just do some, some wonderful things. Um, and I've learned, I've learned a lot from Aww. you in terms of what you use, especially with addiction treatment as well. So that's really, Thank that's you. really means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, you know you had said uh, you were going to join today and tell us a little bit uh, about uh, ART, right? Is that yes. uh, you can yep. do whatever you want, but that was, yeah. um, and I, you know, ART is fascinating to me because it's new in the field. Uh, well, I don't know if it's really, you could tell us more of the history, but it's, I've been hearing about it more recently. And I, I remember there was an old anger management technique called aggression replacement therapy. So I always thought it was that and it's not. Right. And if you Google it, Google thinks you're looking for art therapy oftentimes. So yes. it's nice to do. This is a good resource for people. What, what is, what is ART? So it stands for accelerated resolution therapy. Um, it's fascinating. I'm also trained in EMDR. And so I am an EMDR therapist, like all the way through. When I heard about the ART, I thought there's no way anything is better than or faster than EMDR. So when I went to the training, I was very, you know, like, there's no way. And then, you know, then them doing it, us doing it on each other, uh, it just really opened my eyes. It's it's amazing. It It is one and done is what they say. One session and your trauma is healed. Now, has it been that way in practice? Most of the time, most of the time, it's it's fascinating. Um, I've had some pretty severe PTSD cases where it's actually taken three of those, but that's still so much faster than EMDR. Do you find, uh, and you know, there's a lot of focus today on more rapid techniques, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, because for me, when we talk about that, the trauma being, when we say, you know, we, we throw around people get nervous, right? We throw in things like cured or like relieved or whatever. To me, I, I always look at it like, you know, there are elements you're going to remember things and there are elements of mental health issues that we may deal with, uh, but long-term, but, but as far as the, I think what, what I usually find is we're talking about the acute, like the, the trauma that, because when we say PTSD, like any other thing that ends in D, it's disorder, right? It's mm -hmm. like, am I rising to the level? It's not like all the trauma is gone. I don't remember it. Uh, but it's like the, 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 the maladaptivity of my day to day. And it's interesting that we're finding it can be greatly reduced fairly quickly. And then we can work more productively on maybe some of the effects of the cognitive lessons that I learned and the, in other words, you know, we're dealing with it, but without that panic acuteness, I, am I, am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also, you know, if you look at it in this way, I mean, definitely the memories don't get erased with ART. That is kind of one of the differences with EMDR is that with ART, we focus a lot on imagery, but we alter those images. And so I'm always like over explaining that part because people think or could misinterpret that we're going to actually really alter the facts of the memory. We don't, it, that's not possible. We're actually just altering the images. So the theory is if we can alter the images, then we won't have the same physical and emotional response to the memory. So we still have the facts and the factual side of our mind, but our body and mind doesn't respond as um, as it normally did when we've had those symptoms going on. It's fascinating. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. And one of the things that it's really, really good for is harm reduction. If you think of it in the addiction aspect, uh, you know, when and the reason I also love ART is if you think about it, like it is so scary to go to therapy. So I'm going to go to therapy and I'm going to expose all my ugliness, all the shame, all of the mistakes I've made while I was in active addiction. I'm going to talk about the harm I've caused my family, my children and all of that. Hell no, I'm not doing that, you know talk about hypervigilance in full force 
that shame will keep you from getting the help that you need. And that's why this information is so important because I just always feel like if people could know that there is actual treatment that can help you get better faster, that you don't have to sit in that crap and you don't have to even divulge all of that to me. I just need little pieces and making sure that we're on the right memory, like sticking to the same memory as we uh, process that healing. Um, it, it's just fascinating. You know, people think they've got to be in therapy for many, many years in order to help heal these traumas. And that's not the truth at all. Uh, like I said, it can be one and done one traumatic memory at on one session, and it could be resolved. Like I said before, though, severe cases, sometimes it can take up to three from what I've experienced personally as a clinician, but it's life changing. And, and, Everybody needs to understand that is the root cause of addiction, trauma. I have not met anybody in active addiction or history of addiction that didn't have a long history of trauma. And so why don't we heal the root cause? You know, a lot of people spend so much time trying to read and learn and, you know, working with their conscious part of the brain and then get so mad and frustrated at themselves because, man, I don't want to do this anymore to my family. And yet they continue in that behavior. Well, we need to get to the root. And that is in the subconscious mind. And the way we access that subconscious mind is through bilateral stimulation or eye movements. And, um, it's just fascinating. Once we can heal some of those traumas, that desire to use will lessen naturally. You're, and then, yeah. No, oh, I was just going to say, and then what we do, it's interesting because if the acuteness of the trauma, if we're meeting that need in a more healthy way, I can see where that would open up uh, to really, then we're working on, you know, then, then we're working on actually building good habits in ways that are not right we know we're not frustrating that by by not addressing things it's a it's a fascinating kind of idea now you mentioned bilateral stimulation yes does excel does art still use that is that a, it does. a commonality with emdr yes it does i mean they really try to emphasize the eye movements going back and forth but we can use bilateral stimulation so the tapping bilaterally um and or eye movements and or sound there's headphones that bilaterally you hear the noise. So, okay. So you still, yeah, and I'm familiar with that as applied to EMDR. So that's interesting. So they still use some of the same Absolutely. literal interventions. Would you, I know we've had, we've had some, uh, and ART is something I want to explore on some more episodes of the podcast. And I'm also very interested, by the way, anyone who is out there, I'm, I'm very interested in talking to people who have been through it, either, you know, reading some of your accounts or talking off mic, but also uh, sharing some of that information uh, for anyone who's interested uh, in sharing that. So it's one of the, I'm, I'm in the process. So I just don't know it as well, but we've done some episodes on EMDR and some of the things we can expect going into a session. Can you tell maybe, and, and you can highlight the differences or just say what happens if I walk in to an ART session, you know, what's yeah. going to happen to me? Oh, what are you going yeah. to right. do to me? Yeah. Right, I'm going to run. It's been awesome. Oh, oh Andy, thank you so have much a, for being here. Have a good day. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Fascinating. Thanks. I'm going to go learn about art. <laughs> <laughs> great. Great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So, you know, with the normal intake process, I definitely still have to do a full assessment on the client, making sure that they are right fit to do ART. Um, and I do still do some of the prep work that I was taught with EMDR. That's not necessarily part of the protocol when it comes to ART, but using a skill that's like a calm place, basically a meditative space is helpful to us all. I mean, when we have distress going on in our lives, if we can utilize some skill that's very helpful, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And so I like to do that just to have them have some skills um, when they're at home. Um, and so I will do that prior to getting their trauma history. So that way they're not walking out my door and their nervous system is out of whack and then they really never want to come back again. I try to take it very slow. 
I also yeah. don't ask yeah. them to disclose a lot of the information, very minimum. I only want very minimum because by them speaking too much about it, it's just going to activate their system. And then as we know, it can just create more trauma and, and we don't need to do that. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's one of the, when you talk about people staying away from therapy, I've known plenty of people who they either stay away or they bail when you're taking the old school approach of what they call a trauma narrative, did a whole thing about this the other day uh, yeah. of a trauma narrative, which is you, and I'll, I'll be honest, you know, you found that they did find that this does help people. It takes longer than a lot of these modern techniques. So I'm not going to say it wasn't helpful, but um, the, the thing that's the least helpful about it. And for those who don't know, it's basically you write down the event, you tell the story, you tell the story, you tell the story mm -hmm. while applying, you know, cognitive behavioral relaxation techniques. And you essentially accommodate it into your life as a thing that happened, but it doesn't have the same emotional uh, resonance. Um, and I think there's some similarities with it. It's just that we're trying to do it faster, maybe more accelerated as the, yes. as the name. But yeah. anyway, the, the biggest flaw of it wasn't that it didn't work. It was that people didn't do it. You know, it's like, right. boy, that's intimidating. And like you say, even a uh, part of that application of therapy was you were supposed to find safe people or a safe person other than your therapist and go and tell them the story even, right? Yeah. And write it down and burn it, and write it down and burn it. And it's like, and once again, some people, you know, there are people out there still practicing it and probably some clients who maybe prefer that for whatever, you know, for their own reasons. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you, and, you know, I find it, it's not that you can't, if there is an impulse or a feeling to say, I do want to process it, having some of these techniques, like I know with the MDR or IFS, lowering the reactivity, then if I'm a person who just verbally processes and I want to talk about the events, I can do that in therapy without it being as triggering, hopefully, right? If, if right. I want to, if I choose to, but I shouldn't be required to, is my right. thought. But yeah. so any, anyway, yeah, yeah, so you kind of avoid that. Is that one of the things, or you mentioned, sorry to bounce around, but uh, you mentioned a good candidate. What makes me a good or, or you know, ready or not ready, not as ready for ART? I think just somebody who is willing to kind of go along with it. And what I mean by that is there is a lot of um, creativity that goes with this. And so if somebody is resistant in their mind and they don't want to kind of alter the image, if they're like, no, but that's not how it was. And so they're kind of pushing against, pushing against, not wanting to do it. Then that just tells me that we have some other work to do to get ahead of it. Speaking mm -hmm. of IFS, internal family systems, there's probably a part inside of them that is saying, hell no, we are not going to visit this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so yeah. it just starts coming up with reasons for us to not, not touch it. And so gotcha. we work on that. I educate them on that, the parts inside of them, that that may be why they are so against, you know, creating this, these altering of the images and stuff. So, oh, it, sure. you know. Yeah. So working on actual preparation uh, for that is a, is an important part. Okay. Gotcha. Absolutely. Gotcha. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, yeah, like you go ahead then. You were talking about kind of where you go from there. Yeah. So then after that, I mean, after doing the assessment, making sure they're on board with doing this, then we just begin the session and it takes about 90 minutes. I've been able to shorten it down to 60 minutes, you know, due to insurance reasons sometimes, but um, it's still, I still get the same outcome and it is, it's faster and not as emotional as EMDR. So with EMDR, I'm also trained in hypnosis. And I always thought with well, hypnosis, it's one and done. It's fast. We get it over with and they're good. And what I found with the hypnosis is that about six to nine months later, clients were coming back with the same memory. And I'm like, what the heck? I, you know, it wouldn't fully be healed. Then I got trained in EMDR and I thought, okay, I guess it's because you've got to sit in this pain. You've got to go through it, you know, for four to eight sessions, and then you can finally release it. So then now I get trained in ART and I'm like way confused. I don't understand how this is working and is effective. And I haven't had any client return because the memory has come back and it's, it's 
you know, causing them any harm. Um, because we, we just go really fast and you're only in the emotion temporarily. Like I said, I mean, we get it done within 60 to 90 minutes and then it's over with that trauma mm -hmm. is gone. And what I mean by gone is that then I can have you tell me the full story. So with, with trauma, there's shame associated with it. And so that's why I love EMDR and ART is because you don't have to disclose everything to me. You can keep those shameful things inside you so we can process and heal it. But what I've found is that after we've done the healing, after we've done the work, the client will a lot of the times just start telling me the whole story. And that's, that's amazing. It's because the shame is gone. The physical and emotional response is gone. It doesn't affect them. They know what happened, but it's way back there. It's not today anymore. Um, it's just fascinating. Hmm. Fascinating. That's a, yeah. It's a very, very interesting approach to say, um, I, I, well, and it reminds me a lot of the modern approaches now that we use are based off of, uh, you have somatic approaches with physical movement. And and this is essentially that. It's interesting how uh, I was just talking with someone about this the other day. Uh, the, the things that we study and that we research, especially in mental health, right? There's research that goes around the what is happening. And then there's some that goes around the why. And it's so fascinating to me how there's so many things over here that are like, yeah, we're academically trying to figure out why does this work? As our theories, right? Because that even applies to medication. Yeah. Even medications that observably work 60, 75% of the time, like a lot of SSRIs do, um, which is significant. It's not, you know, that doesn't, that's a majority, but it's, you know, have some results. But yet they just, fa I mean, some, as far as they can tell, some of the theories of why it works, uh, they, they were wrong, right? And it's like, right. but they're still working. We still see the what, and we can measure the what. Anyway, yeah. so these things are really yeah. fascinating to say. Uh, so, and, and I don't know your thoughts about this, but I look at it and say, so we were using the, the talk therapy trauma narrative, and then mm -hmm. we're using bilateral stimulation, or we're using somatic movement, or we're using parts work. And to me, it's kind of like we're using different ways to get the what that we want. We're, right, we're, we're right. using different things that seem to go when we do this. Most people seem to feel quite a bit better. And with this one, they seem to feel quite a bit better, quite a bit faster than the other yes. one. Yeah. Um, and so that's the part. And then we go into, and I think there's theoretical things of why does bilateral stimulation seem to work for most people. Um, it's like we have ideas and we talk about it, but it's like that's a little harder to get into brain and be like, is it? Is this it? You know, there's functional brain imaging and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so it's very interesting to see this. We, we have this these these two co-occurring things in yeah. research it's like how is this helping and why is it helping you know right and, and right for well, me I'm, walking in as a client really the what is the most important for that i mean the why is more academic in my mind <laughs> for sure for sure well the theory behind bilateral stimulation is that that is how we access the subconscious part of the mind us talking we're in our conscious brain and the only way to get it into our subconscious brain is um, repetition over and over and over again. And then hopefully maybe then it'll be into our subconscious part of the mind. That's kind of how narrative uh, trauma work used to work or kind of hopefully that, work at times. That, yeah. You know what I mean? The repetition. Oh, it's interesting. And people can critique my history here if they want, but my mind and my understanding is, you know, going back to the days of Freud where he theorized the subconscious, right. And, yeah. and, and people thinking about thinking, you know, and philosophy, the the whole idea is like how do we access that if we're not conscious of something by definition yeah. do we, you know what can we right. do and right. so this is a an interesting way to kind of say is there something that i'm not consciously choosing to have the trauma response and so how do i access it oh hi valerie hey dwight how are you <laughs> doing good uh welcome welcome this is uh valerie from hi, the valerie. mom is to love podcast nice to meet you. Me. And my dog, apparently, too. Yeah, the, we're part, glad to have your dog I, on here, too. As soon as I press play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somehow they know. Well, get them, his own, get them, get them their own screen, and I they know, can join, right? too. Like I said, everyone's welcome. By the way, I'll remind everybody, <laughs> as I do when people join. Anybody out there, if you're watching or listening, feel free to go to DwightHurst.com slash live. Click on the to join. It's a call-in feature for everyone. But So and I'm glad, to, speaking of call-ins, uh, Valerie, glad to have you. This is Teresa. 
Hi, uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Teresa. I've yeah. really been listening to your all of your interesting information, and it sounds incredible. This um, this new therapy. Can you remind us again one, one more time what the name of it is? Accelerated resolution therapy, and I think it's been around since 2010 or 2011. I can't remember, but it's just getting out there more now. It's more. A um, lot more therapists are getting trained in it. So, mm -hmm. and it, it just really works. I think the hesitation is, you know, like I said, I just never thought anything would be faster than EMDR. And I found that it actually is. And, you know, shame is what holds us back from getting the treatment that we need. You know, it takes a lot of courage and strength to get out there and face those things. But if they could know that we can get it done faster, I'm hoping that that'll give them that strength to be like, you know what, F it, I'm going to do it. I got to go, you know, and, and then we can help with all that other, like the addiction pieces, you know, healing the traumas. Like I said, the desire to use will reduce tremendously. I like the individualization you mentioned too, because uh, like I said, you know, it's intimidating to say, well, I'm going to come in and, uh, as you put it, it's just like that, you know, hell no, I'm not going to go in and like, someone's going to tell me you're going to do this in this order. Uh, you know, even if it's not about something really emotional, I, a lot of us have a resistance to just doing what we're told anyway, but, <laughs> and I think, boy, it doesn't that go in with addiction. Yeah. But there's no shortage of people telling us what to do. And so then, cause what you're telling me is obviously there's approach techniques that everybody's going to experience. But the way we give the history, how much I disclose, what we talk about, um, and when even, like you said, if someone's like, I don't know about this, it's like, well, let's talk about it some more then, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. if someone said, I want to come in and just talk more for a couple more and then we'll try it. I, yeah. It's like, fine, you know? And if it's like, well, I want to do it, I want to do it today. I mean, if it's assessment time, maybe you're still assessing, but right. You know, but yeah, it, 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 it's more individualized in a way, uh, or at least, and I think that's the approach we see with a lot of modern treatment. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's important for anybody who's had trauma that they do have options, choices, not being dictated to, like a lot of the trauma was forced upon them, not chosen. And so as many choices as they can get so they can be empowered, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I will just be there to educate and encourage. And so whenever they're ready, then we're ready to go. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, Valerie, as as people know, if they've heard, you know, you've been on uh, the podcast and also mm -hmm. I've been, I was lucky enough to be on yours as well, the, uh, To Mom is to Love. Yeah. And, uh, going through, you know, I, I'm curious some of your thoughts that you bring in as we're talking about both the therapy and trauma and also just in addiction when it comes into parenting um, and mm -hmm. some of the things you've seen with your work. Yeah. I mean, I think that. Well, th and thank you for for having this, Dwight. I think this is incredible. And I'm I'm very much a learner in this area. I'm a nurse practitioner, um, but a lot of my work now with two mamas to love is essentially um, embracing imperfection. And there's so much that goes into that. But essentially saying it's okay, it's okay to feel like you're not enough like we're always feeling like that right like it's okay to not be okay it's okay we don't have to be perfect we none of us are and we as a community are lifting each other up and saying it's okay that we are who we are if that makes sense like, <laughs> but i think that we are hearing so much i think in our generation prior i know like this whole pass fail thing um and for me when I attended my kids' uh, school yesterday, they had like a curriculum night. Um, they talked about the growth mindset. And I'm so glad that that's now becoming a thing where we're talking about how can we improve? It may not be right now, but it's not yet, as opposed to this pass fail. And I think we can apply that in all aspects of our lives and motherhood or just people anywhere and everywhere. So, um, so yeah, I'm just learning so much about all of these topics that you're presenting, Dwight, and I think it's all incredible. And I think we're all as a community learning together and lifting each other up. And um, so that's kind of what I'm all about and uh, happy to be here. 
Yeah, fighting against the shame association, yeah. and I think it's compounded by addiction. Uh, you know, by the things that happen when we're in active addiction and the rejection that we get and things. Of course, mm -hmm. there's that that idea, and sometimes, unfortunately, even in treatment, where it's yeah. like, oh, you know, you're. And sometimes people are even seen long after their recovery when they're working even they're with the same people or whatever they still get it related to as almost less than right and so yeah. it's hard to have that acceptance totally yes, yes yeah. that shame it's so powerful right like i think of that visual of going inwards and in order to kind of open ourselves up and be vulnerable, we have to kind of open up. And that's literally what, what we say, open up. And being proud, um, the word pride is this expansiveness, right? And how do we expand ourselves and move through the shame? And I think that takes so much courage and so much work, um, but it's so worth it for that self-compassion and for, um, you know, working on those mental back roads I like to talk about, like just working on how can I be more compassionate to myself? And it starts with me and starting to, to grow. We're all growing. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Dwight, I've got to head out. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me on. I truly appreciate your time. Tell, Hey, tell everybody, would you, what's your, your practices email or uh, uh, not email, but uh, <laughs> website. It's www.saliascounseling.org. Salias, S-A-L-A-I-S. Awesome. Great. Great Thanks. things you're doing. And I love that print Thank hanging you. up behind you, by the way. That's not oh. tangential, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Thanks, so much. Teresa. You guys have a good day. You, you too. too. So nice Thanks. to meet you. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Um, uh, Valerie, I wanted to ask. Yeah. Uh, with uh, we had a, a topic a little bit ago and i'm looking back and it was all dudes so uh and you also have not <laughs> only not only are you not uh but you have an expertise in this area we were talking about uh studies that have been done about addiction and uh whether or not doctors screen for that with during pregnancy in particular mm -hmm. and it, with women in general also i think you can see the same similar thing and the study that I was, I was at some conference and, oh, maybe you heard this, but talking about how they said how many uh, kind of actively screened for addiction during pregnancy rather than just assume that people aren't, you know, yeah. using drugs or alcohol. And they found nobody is asking uh, um, uh -huh. pretty much. I mean, statistically or, or whatever out of the study that it's just not happening. This is several years ago. But, but as far as like when it comes to parenting and people, you know, working with their kids and stuff, I, I don't. We're not really actively screening. What do you find when it affects moms as far as people looking out for their addiction patterns? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's like such an interesting point because looking back, like during my pregnancy visits and all, that wasn't that wasn't a question that was part of the the routine questions, right? Like it was this. I remember a couple questions um, that were breezed through of, um, you know, I think it was like, do you feel safe in the home or something like that? They would check the box. And um, I always thought that was interesting that even like with those topics, like how quickly we go through them. And um, I think that it's an interesting point that we, it's not like more I, I guess I don't know the the that's a bigger issue of how can we get more time in our visits to ask these type of Boy. questions and yeah all. I mean to that point Teresa was just talking about how with this like this therapy it's intended to be ninety minutes but it's like we got to cram it into an hour yeah. for people to get the session reimbursed right anyway yeah yeah that's a big problem yeah and um and an addiction isn't as much of my expertise so i would have to defer to see you know what it what those type of screens are but i know from just like a primary care standpoint it's again there's not much um there's not much asked you know like i was actually writing about this recently um of the pediatric exam and how hold on one second Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Speaking of pediatric exams. That's right. We're putting it into practice. No, you go for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. It, yeah. We'll go in about five minutes. 
Um, so, well, I guess like speaking of pediatric exams, there's one of my kids there. And, um, but so that's always on my mind. We bring our kids to the doctors. Can I start with my food? Okay. You can, you can finish it. <laughs> We bring our kids to the doctor for, you know, checkups and all that. And we screen for developmental areas. So there's um, gross motor, fine motor, cognitive, social, and speech, right? And um, it's very kind of routine, kind of like the questions that we check off the list and all that in pediatrics. But once we, we become about 18 to 25 years of age, whenever we kind of graduate to adult primary visits, that stops like those developmental questions stop a bit and you know here and there if you have more time or whatever you talk about physical activity i would say that's probably the more common one asked but even then it's just so mm, clinical like you the people say well how many days do you exercise for example like how many days of the week because what the american heart association recommends i think it's 150 hours of exercise or something i'd have to look up the specifics but instead of creatively asking kids we ask them what do you like to do for fun you know to get more elicit more of a response um we don't do that with adults we don't say what do you like to do for fun and have that conversation or those more open-ended questions um again i think partly because of time but i i think it's like this broader thing of how can we prevent how can we do more with primary prevention whether that be with addiction or anything else how can we be able to assess more patients before it becomes an issue like what we need more resources out there we need more time to be able to do those things and i think that's kind of like my call to action a lot i've been doing recently of like how can we as a society come together and say you know primary prevention is important and how can we start doing more of those things, asking more open-ended questions, even though it may take a bit more time, but these are important. Or, you know, how can we provide more resources to the patients? And I love how, you know, when I drive my kids to school, we drive by one of the counties here in the Chicagoland area, like one of like the county campuses. And I noticed recently it has 988 the information about 988 on there. And I think that's mm -hmm. so great that I'm seeing that finally. And it says just in bold as you're driving, you matter. And like, oh, that's awesome that we're finally, we're finally like seeing that. I see it every day now, you matter. And then the 988 number, um, which is in the US and Canada. Um, but anyway, I just don't know. And I haven't been at my primary care provider in a while or whatever, but I don't think that's really being asked. Like, for example, that type of like on a routine, but maybe it is, but I feel like it's more like when a patient gives information as opposed to that. And I'm kind of going on a tangent, right? But, <laughs> but <laughs> not at all. No, not at all. We're sense? talking about, oh, very much. So we're talking about the idea of proactive yes. health care and, and <laughs> as it happens with addiction, I think it touches on something that I know you talk about a lot on your, your podcast, which is that um, when we think of parenting and the healthy bits of parenting, we think about the kids and we talk about the kids yeah. and we talk about techniques when we interact with the kids and we talk about kids, kids, kids. And it's yes. kind of safer. I think to, we externalize the topic instead of our own healthcare is a parenting issue. Right. And, and parenting yeah. is part of our own healthcare because it goes towards our self-esteem. It goes towards, you know, the, the, um, the, a lot of realities of our health, yeah. but, but addiction recovery and mental health and just being healthy in general, um, things that we might not think of. It's like, Oh, the only time we think of it is when we blame ourselves for giving our kids bad experiences. Mm. Um, instead of saying like, boy, if I, you know, do I stabilize my health? Um, you know, that's part of my parenting is to be as healthy as I can. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that I like to think of the car example of like, you don't just take your car in when there's a problem, like you have maintenance, there's maintenance things. We, you know, we are getting these checkups in. we're doing the self care. We're doing things that fill our cup up. So we're able to provide, it's like, I feel like it's overused, but I do think it is important, like putting that oxygen on, uh, yourself before, the kids or whoever yeah, around you, you yeah, know, whole airplane analogy. Right. You know, yeah, yeah, we do use it a lot, but it's cause it, it fits, I think really fits. well. Right. Yeah. It does. And then sometimes I think we need people that are almost like the airline 
stewardess or whatever who are reminding you of that, right? Like, because I mean, I think they have to or whatever on before the flight, but we do need that. We do need those reminders, you know, like we know, oh yeah, I got to put my oxygen on first. <laughs> but um, sometimes in the moment, like you don't think about that, right? And um, I think that I always use this example of running late for school. And I know it's not necessarily, it, it, it's kind of like, a lighter topic, but I think it kind of ties into so much of life of when you have this kind of um, anxious, worried response, or you're frustrated or something, it's all from that amygdala. And I know um, you guys were talking about that earlier, and I think that's just so prevalent with everything where this amygdala is so primitive and it thinks that you know there's a matter of life or death that you have to either fight, flight, or fawn. And, but it's other animals share that structure and the, the amygdala can't distinguish between, is this a real fear or a perceived one? Like, or is this, is this fear false or real? Like a tornado alarm, they sound the same. And, um, but one maybe is a test tornado alarm and the other is a real tornado. And the amygdala always thinks it's a real tornado. Yes. So when I, if I'm going to school, like taking the kids to school, and I use a lot of parenting examples just because that's kind of my current life stage, but you could put it, anything into it. Like if you're running late for, for school or for work or whatever that is, and you're frustrated, like that fight or flight's kind of coming in, your heart rate's increased and all this stuff, you're, you start to yell or you start to just get, you know, it's, you're not thinking as clearly, right? Because you almost turn into more of like that primitive self a bit. Um, and I feel like when I take when I recognize that first of all, that I'm like, oh, you know, I, my fight or flight's activated right now. Let me take a mental back road and try something different. Try neuroplasticity in a different way of like gratitude or mindfulness or that self-love and compassion. Like I was talking about earlier, then it builds that a bit more. And it's like exercising my brain in a sense. Um, so, but then also like not taking myself as seriously. I don't know, like when I'm in the car line, like one time, like, we um we were just running late and like we accidentally bumped a little bit into another car and everyone was fine <laughs> in front of all the teachers None of, yep i know the feeling yeah <laughs> and, the, and the teachers were like kids get out of the car give mom a moment and i'm like <laughs> emotional because i'm in fight or flight and now i just bumped into a car and <laughs> the teachers um they were fine. I think I, you know, I think it was, I think almost like it was this, this moment of like, uh, I don't even know how to explain it. But then like the lady came out and she was so nice. She was so nice. And I just started crying and they're like, aren't you the mom that talks about <laughs> like a podcast? And stuff? Oh no, and that's where you don't want to get right now. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm embracing imperfection. Okay. <laughs> that's good though. I mean, you know, it, it is, you get that and hopefully you got good feedback. But, I, did, uh, <laughs> I did get <laughs> well because it was on like the school then they had to like follow up and make sure like they're like are you doing okay are you I'm like i'm fine it, it was just a fight or flight thing and here <laughs> i am talking about this slide this is funny but i do think moms can relate parents can relate people can relate to these type of things i mean obviously we it's it's something that we don't want to happen but sometimes we get into this mode of this uh just hyper-focusing on whatever it is. And we're kind of like in our own head and not aware of the world around us sometimes. And yeah. how do we, how do we get more into each other's worlds? And gosh, Dwight, I feel like I'm going on a tangent with it. But... Not at all. Not at all. I pre no, I think it's, it's a helpful thing. You know, you mentioned embracing imperfection. I have a quote up on my wall. I won't pull that down. Like I did the leaf picture earlier because it's too high continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection as a Mark Twain yeah. quote. Um, and hi, oh, I, like I, I like that. <laughs> Thanks for joining. I think your microphone is muted. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it is. I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to get my headset working. It doesn't like me right now. I guess. <laughs> Welcome. Glad to have you. You were going to say, uh, Valerie, sorry, I cut you off. No, you're fine. And I actually, oh, okay. speaking of, I, I'm going to have to get going. Speaking of school pickups, I got to go. Pick yes, up. I'm with you. I'm with <laughs> you. Yeah. 
And I heard, I we all clearly heard you tell your daughter five minutes. He's f- about five oh. minutes ago, so it worked. <laughs> well, there you go. You got we the knew, We knew it there. was coming. And look at this, you know, in practice, practicing what you <laughs> preach. It's the To Mom Is To Love podcast is your, is your podcast, so everybody should be listening to that. So. Thank you so much. Yeah, To Mom Is To Love <laughs> and Dwight's actually going to be joining us on, we're doing like a global summit in, uh, in I don't know, months from now, in October. So we'll, we'll yes. get more in that Super later exciting. on, too. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. Right. See ya. Bye. Bye. Isabel, welcome. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? Doing all right so far. Man, we're through, uh, we're almost through the live stream. It always surprises me. I think this is the first year that I have not been alone yet uh, throughout the five hours. And I'm really grateful for everybody's (laughs) support. I usually have some time where I'm, you know, going off on my own things. I got notes all over, you know, and it's nice not to use them um, because hearing people. But so, yeah. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. Ah, how are you doing today and how are you feeling uh with all the i don't know just happy uh, first of all happy international uh opioid overdose awareness day <laughs> yeah happy happy day. Ah, for those that have their, <laughs> you know who have their their yeah. uh yeah there's an acronym right it's uh international yeah, overdose i o a d no i o d a that's what it is. Yeah, there we go. There's an organization. It's a nonprofit, but <laughs> but anyway, I have how... a lot of knowledge on it. <laughs> um, I'm doing great. I'm drinking way too much coffee, which uh, you you might have to suffer with, but at least I'm a little quicker at talking than usual. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm curious some of your some of your thoughts about uh, how these things uh, apply. I know that. Uh, you do a lot of like pop culture work and work on uh, uh, movies and things in your, in your work online and in podcasting. Um, We've talked a little bit about uh, some of those things, embracing passions and embracing things we enjoy. Uh, But, but uh, you know, whatever, I don't want to, I don't want to drive the bus here. What what are some of your thoughts so far? Um, Like as far as, you know, in relation to this goes, I, I mean, I've only been podcasting for a year and I mean, it's definitely helped me a lot with um, just my overall anxiety and trying to have a conversation. I'm not the best at it, obviously still, but you know, it's a lot better than it was when I first started. Um, let's see. Imagine if that was the criteria, you have to be the best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my show would be off <laughs> for no, that for sure. No, that's not true. Well, it's not the best. And then, and as I told you before, you know, especially with like I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons now for like almost two to three years, I think, and that was a really big um, help with all of that as well. It it, it always feels like things happen. I hate to, I hate that whole oh everything happens for a reason because sometimes people say it at the that like the worst times, but there are times where it's like this does kind of feel like it happened for a reason. Like I had like uh i started learning dungeons and dragons and then eventually i kind of got the enough courage to be like sure i'll do a podcast and now i have two podcasts and that's all you know if if it wasn't for the sequence of those things happening i, I wouldn't i wouldn't be here that's pretty pretty awesome it's just interesting how things work out like that uh, ben has posted a comment oh snap <laughs> that's bodacious dudes host one of your shows <laughs> yeah which you were on. Oh, yeah, we talked about um, about the return to Oz. Which was yes, great. that was um, super fun. Yeah, so I'm sure some sometimes people are like, well, who was on drugs when they made this movie? And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, well, and you cover 80s and uh, is it 80s and 90s or just 80s? Uh, just 80s. And then um, my, like the uh, Rabbit Hole podcast editor and producer does the 90s one. Okay. So yes. Kind of like yes. a spin off. Yeah, there's a lot of, but there's a lot of that type of logic in a lot of eighties uh, properties and things that are like, wow, have, what kind of drugs? Um, yeah. I, yes, as you were saying that um, it, it's an interesting thing. First of all, that concept of everything happens for a reason for me, you know, speaking just from my own observations as a therapist, I find that that is a helpful thought process if it's applied from self to self. 
Whereas if it's applied from other to self, it is usually not uh, as helpful when someone else tells me, you know, prescriptive affirmations are, I'm not a fan of those when other people, yeah. you know, we tell other people how to feel based off an affirmation. Um, you know, uh, unless there's a big qualifier of like, well, this helps me, you know, that's maybe I'll allow it, but, uh, <laughs> No one's looking for my approval, but I find that, you know, if it's like, oh, I feel like this happened either for a reason or it just seemed like it happened at the right time. You know, for me, reasons could be things, that, you know, philosophically, if people believe I discovered a reason that was already there for, for whatever reason. Um, or did I find one that made sense to me and maybe it came from me? I don't know. To me, it may matter to the person, their own belief system, but it doesn't matter psychologically. It's beneficial either way. <laughs> I find. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, you know, there's a, an interesting point um, that you bring up and you were kind enough uh, to come just the other day. It hasn't aired yet, but uh, you came on the podcast when we did this thing I'm experimenting with, which is uh, RPG games, real play for role playing games, uh, experimenting with both in my practice and on the podcast of sharing how those can be uh, useful for, several reasons that are are healthy and i wanted to i did want to share that mostly because it's on my mind but when people are getting away from drug use um i think that an important thing is having building a life that's worth living that we enjoy right yeah. and there's also oftentimes replacing we're replacing something that might be recreational or it might just take up a lot of our time and there might even be whole the need to meet new people Oftentimes, if I'm if I'm having to cut people out of my life that are not safe for relapse purposes and stuff, um, and and one, so one of the reasons I've I've been embracing this and a lot of people are studying this is that board games and uh, role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons or many of the other thousands of of opportunities to have those or to do those, it involves other people and it involves like processing uh, feelings. It involves social interactions both literally social interactions we're having with people, but then also the characters that we play have to have complex social situations as well. Right. Yeah. Um, that's why I use it in social skill training for youth and stuff, and but it's been great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And I go I on like here, but like a poster child, like for that, because I definitely, like, I think I told you the first time I played, they were like, Oh, well you're in a crowded market. And my hands started getting sweaty. I'm like, how, how, how crowded is it? Is it like really crowded? Like, is there a lot of, like, this is imaginary and I'm still like, Oh, I yeah. didn't know I had these feelings about being in a social setting. <laughs> okay. I'm learning so much about myself while playing someone else. <laughs> it reminds me in some ways of, you know, they do a uh, drama based uh, therapy or psychodrama where people will uh, literally like either act out or they'll you know, use acting techniques or things like that. Role playing uh, visualizations are a big part of therapy. And so in this case, we're literally, and I think when it's fun, there's research about games, even with video games, of are they emotionally beneficial to people? And and often they are. Um, but one of the things they find is that when you develop something simply to be therapeutic and it's not also fun uh, or it's just made for fun, that those are actually more beneficial. And the main reason seems to be that people do them. That's the main reason. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do them if they're not fun. If it's like, I mean, yeah. think about, you know, a math like video game. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in school, you would play a math video game just because it was the only one you're allowed to play. You wouldn't necessarily go home and do a lot of math video games. Pro most people, I think, um, you know, unless they were also fun or you do just something in general that, but you look at something like Dee that involves math, but you learn to do the math because it's fun, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. What so could you share that a little bit more with people? What do you find helps you when it comes to like, um, like you're saying the uh, when we're saying the um, uh, anxiety or just those kinds of things when you're role playing? What do you experience? You it's triggering in some ways because it feels like a real situation. But what else? What's what's that? Uh, what else does it do for you? Um. Yeah. Definitely. Like the problem solving. Um, definitely diffusion of situ situations where we can sometimes the DM doesn't care how much we try to psychologically talk out of a, a fight it's going to be a fight no matter what um, but it's it's just been really fun because I, I have had to not I guess kind of I've personally dealt with 
like an, an addiction and then mostly, but the biggest part of dealing with people um, around me that have addiction and um, not, not, not as much anymore, thankfully, but still um, coming, like going into the pandemic, kind of secluding myself away and I got used to my own company again and then having to like you know, rejoin society, um, picking up D&D definitely aid that and again going into podcasting um aid mm-hmm. that because normally if i would got, i would never just hop on a live thing knowing that people might be watching because i'd be too nervous but now i'm like oh it's whatever it's also you know it's light so it's i'm cool with it because i know you're here. <laughs> well and that's a that's a big part is building community you know yeah. whatever ways we find to do it and that's actually one of the things i like about podcasting the most has been meeting people and it's interesting because I think every, I mean, most, not everybody today, but, but most of the people who have joined on today, many of them I met through podcasting, actually, for me, that that's one of the things that's uh, great about it. Sometimes I think people, oh, I don't know, they have the wrong, you to say like, they're doing it for the wrong reasons, because whatever reasons people do things are your own reasons. But, um, but I think community building in our own life of finding our, our people to use a, yeah. maybe a cliche phrase or something. Um, we have such a, a, we have a lot of tools that make that so we can go beyond just the people who live like immediately next door to me. Right. Yeah. And if you happen to go to a place, if you have a social place, IRL, right. If I go to work and I know some people there and I get like a best friend at work or something, that's lucky. Or if I happen to have a neighbor I love, that's lucky. Um, but what if I don't, and what if I don't go to, you know, if I'm going to school or if I go to a church or, you know, if I already have an established like bowling league or something. Um, but what if I get high with someone on my bowling league? There's a complicated, like, you know, so, so using yeah. some of these like different kind of tools and communities, I think that, that we may branch out online, uh, I think is a great tool that we don't sometimes think about. Right. Yeah. 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 What's uh what do you find um in in order I'm I'm going to not just guess cuz you were just saying like you know there would be anxiety beforehand and you know even just playing the 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 D&D or doing a podcast coming on here how did you face that did you find was it did you have to kind of push through some of those anxieties originally I did mm-hmm. I think um which earlier the Rules of Justice guys were on and they were gracious enough to let me be a guest on there. I was so nervous, <laughs> so, so incredibly nervous that being my first time on there and I, I, I had like a couple of drinks, unfortunately, but I really did not want to lean on that. That's not something I wanted to lean on at all. Um, but at the same time, I was like, if I don't do something, I'm just going to be like, you know what, take a thought, I'm not going to come to <laughs> But otherwise, I think that was the only time where I felt like I I just couldn't handle it. But otherwise, I have I'm just trying to just push through it. But as I kept doing it, I, it's just been easier. I mean, the only thing I'm on right now is caffeine, but that I had already planned to try to come in. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it, it brings up the idea of transition too. I think that sometimes it's not being ready for something; it's being ready enough. And yeah. sometimes we have different ways we get to something healthy at first, right? I don't know. They, uh, whatever we blend it with. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, it's, it's just for me, especially, I'm just like, well, I'm just going to keep trying to do it until like it, it gets done. I don't, I try not to think about it because I also feel like the more I think about it, the more I can spike myself into like getting really nervous. Like the, like I said, the palm sweaty thing, like it was, a, is a big one for me or just feeling like almost like fight or flight kind of, I just want to like, I don't want to deal with this right now. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just been practice. It's just practice making perfect. And, you know, sometimes I'm still, still a knucklehead and don't say things right. But, you know, I try to learn. <laughs> it's um, like the diving board uh, dynamic for me. It's like you get it on a diving board and the longer you wait to jump, the less likely you are to jump. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've worked in haunted houses, but you can't get me to go through one. <laughs> <laughs> I will work in a haunted house all night long, but like at night, if they don't turn those sounds off, I'm very scared walking out to the entrance of the haunted house trying to get. Oh, real? So even the ones where it's like, here's my colleagues that are still acting. I don't want to walk by them. 
when they're in character. Oh no, like they'll be cleared out, but even if they have just like the sound effects, like for I was uh oh uh, yeah that I was in, it was like a a meat shop. So they had all these cool. grinding and like cutting noises and like pig squeals and stuff. So even though the place was empty or was emptying, I would still feel really nervous walking through it like someone might <laughs> jump out at me. And I'm like, I'm the someone that would jump out, you know, but here I am still so weird yes. about it. <laughs> Boy, you know, that that I hadn't thought about that. An empty one of those would be just as scary, or maybe even more sometimes. <laughs> Just yeah, because it's all in your own mind. The fear is, is just in your mind. And you know, the real serial the killers, yeah, the real zombies and serial killers aren't going to come in when there's people there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my brain would do. It would tell me yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Was it one of those where people uh, like like punch each other and, and uh, sign a waiver to get... Uh, not punch each no. other, but to, uh, yeah, have contact. Yeah, I know those, you, but like where they can those scare me stuff. more than a regular one. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was just a regular one, you know, I try to keep your distance and um, you deal with a lot of people trying to also come in with liquid courage because they're afraid. And for some reason they think that won't make them afraid. And it's like, no, it just makes you want to, when you're scared, instead of realizing, oh, I'm just scared, you get violent and try to punch the actor, which is terrible like we don't want to deal with that this is our job guys yes yes yeah yeah a lot of that i'm gonna guess threatened dudes Uh, the threatened dude dynamic probably comes to play in there as well but uh... so so much we had so many issues with with that i don't think i ever heard of an issue with with a woman doing that unfortunately it was always intoxicated or you know men on drugs unfortunately well you know a a lot of times (laughs) that does play into there's uh different Sometimes different reasons. I think uh, uh, sometimes the more traditionally we go with gender roles, the masculine uh, uh, intoxicant use often oftentimes is to, you know, buying into that that very toxic masculinity definition, right? Yeah. If I got to be strong and stoic and unafraid, and sometimes I need to be altered to feel like I can do that. And as you put it, some of that that obviously backfires many times, but. Yeah. But then again, you know, there's those memes and those jokes around the the internet that say like, this is what a man will do to avoid therapy. And they show pictures of dudes doing, you know, crazy. This is how far a guy will go to avoid going to therapy. Um, and sometimes it's that it's like, boy, you know, my health is getting destroyed, but I still, at least I'm not, you know, at least I feel like I'm not projecting as much weakness. Maybe I'm doing bad, you know, toxic dude, traditionally dude things, but at least I'm not looking as weak or whatever that I think. So I'm not talking about my feelings. <laughs> yeah. It's just so ridiculous. You know, especially as you get older, it's just, just talk it out, buddy. And if you are, don't take it out on me. I, I yeah, I hated that. <laughs> yeah. Don't people... Just take it out on, on the yeah. zombie costumed person or whatever. Did you play a yeah. character? Oh, I mean, not only in the the costume, but just in life, like right, uh, right, yeah. Um, I think who had uh, was basically an addict. Like it wasn't a specific one thing; it was just anything that they could be on, and then yeah, they would just be always angry all the time. I want to. I'll bounce this off of you here too. I want to show an acronym. I thought of this when Andy was on, um, and and I think what we're talking about now is very much this. And so I'm going to throw out HALT, which is an acronym that has to do. A lot of times with addiction treatment, we say HALT, which is an acronym that stands for, and by the way, you can you can do a lot with acronyms. Therapists love acronyms, apparently. Um, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. The idea being, oh, no. if you want to get high or you're going to relapse, yeah, that's me all, all the time. <laughs> but you say to yourself, HALT, and then, then the acronym is, you know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Because uh, those are needs. And if I'm feeling at risk, yeah. then I can assess, do I have needs? And these aren't all the needs in the world, but they are common ones. Just like you said. Yeah, I have those. Let's see. Let me check through them right now. No, <laughs> I'm not lonely because <laughs> we're talking. Isn't that good? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but but anyway, yeah, going through that and saying like, because if I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, there are fixes for those that are healthy, right? Um, yeah. And then... Uh, but they, if we don't even know that we're feeling them, which oftentimes that's not how it presents. We just want to get high. We want to get drunk. We want to whatever. Uh, we want to yeah. escape one way or the other. Uh, but we're not even necessarily, we have the instinct to escape, but we don't even necessarily always consciously know why, right? 
Yeah, yeah. It took sometimes. Um, it took me a while. So I went through. Uh, my best friend did a life coach, like kind of class where they learned to be a life coach, and so they were like, "Hey, will you be like my guinea pig as I learn?" <laughs> um, and I was just so surprised because I was like, "Well, yeah, you're my best friend. I should be able to just, you know." talk about all this stuff but when we got into it and the questions she would bring up and talk about I sat there I was like oh I don't think I am ready to talk about this I'm like I gotta have to write that down um and I started like realizing things about myself like uh sometimes just because I was angry didn't mean I was actually angry sometimes it was because I was confused and the confusion aggravated me and then I landed on the final step of being angry and uh, it took me a while to, to take those moments to halt and think about how did I get to this point? Because it isn't just all of a sudden you're just angry. Like there's things that lead up to it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Very much this, the, the concept of digging in, right. And we find things we didn't know were there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's challenging, you know, especially if we, I find that it sometimes it's on the one hand, it can get easier. On the other hand, sometimes it's still, it becomes increasingly challenging when we know what's going to happen. When I dig in, I'm going to find stuff, right? Because yeah. uh, I've done it before. And that can be intimidating too, I think. It hmm. is. It's incredibly intimidating. Yeah. And if you're not ready, you'll do everything you can to just not be self-aware. Mm -hmm. Because that's really what it is, just getting in tune with your own emotions and figuring out why are you feeling this way? Because there were times where I would feel lonely and I could be surrounded by a group of people. You know, it was, it was like, what's the actual issue? And it was like, oh, because these people at the end of the day didn't actually genuinely value me as a person. Um, yeah. just like, a, like whether they were taking advantage or just like, I was just someone to emotionally manipulate, whatever the case was, you know, like you, you have to stop and realize, well, if I'm feeling lonely while around people, what's, what's really happening? I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, it's a very good example because loneliness isn't tied to the physical presence of people. Exactly. And yet, if we don't understand that dynamic, we feel silly about it. And feeling silly or stupid is in some ways more dangerous even because that's a, that's a special flavor of shame, I think, is like it, it's, it's sometimes feeling guilt or like I did something bad. It at least ties into something I did. Right. Whereas yeah. if I feel like I'm unrealistic or silly or people see me that way, then I just think I I don't. I'm just like, I don't matter. I'm just not even a, you know, am I really even a serious person that people take seriously? Right. Yeah, exactly. It can be a really, yeah, it, that can be very damaging. So uh, very, very much. And I, I think very useful, the useful things we're thinking of, I'm um, talking about, I, boy, you triggered a big thought in mine. It was, yes, I found it. Okay. There we go. I wasn't physical, but I found I it in my brain. Um, when you're talking about digging into why am I angry and that, you know, people call anger a secondary emotion. I don't think that's always necessarily true. We can have a primary reaction of anger, but, but I think it's often there's something underneath it and it's almost always tied to something else. Um, but I had a, a friend of mine who used to say uh, when he was angry, he would ask himself, what am I, or am I anxious about anything that for him, yeah. he found anxiety yeah. was tied to it. I think it's similar to what, oh, yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Cause, cause that, that... Exactly. sometimes people will say things and, and then they like plant this anxiety in your brain and you're trying to combat it, not realizing like if I'm starting, they've just passed on this anxiety to you and then you get upset and you're just like, wait, this isn't mine. You got my feelings at all. These mm -hmm. are just, you were given over to me. Like I've been emotionally manipulated. I don't know. Oh, we're not going to stop this right now. I'm not angry anymore. We're stopping. <laughs> yeah. Like we're going to walk this back and then talk to that person and be like, okay, so you need to not do that, please. Because I would appreciate not getting your anxiety. Because I have plenty of my own. I really, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also just having the moments and not like, cause I had a big issue of thinking that having general conversations was a confrontation because I was like in a relationship where any conversation would become a confrontation. So I started to like put the two in the same category. You start and to anticipate it's, like it's going to happen. Yeah. And so after a while, you just kind of shut up and don't say anything and just, you know, well, I guess this is just a me issue. I'll just, I just need to get over myself or something, um, which is not great. It's 
terrible to have to tell yourself, oh, I just need to get over myself. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you, you have genuine issues with something. Um, they're real things, you know, a lot of times they were really real feelings. And I'm like, well, maybe I'm just being crazy. So there's no point in bringing this up. This is going to turn into something that is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> there's risk factors. Yeah. There's risk factors to what leads us there. I think, and it's always interesting to me how this is counterintuitive, especially I think people don't understand the dynamic of addiction, but um, when it's easy to do, by the way, if someone, you know, so when someone has someone in their life who has addiction, or sometimes we even apply this judgment to ourselves, um, let's say they do things that aren't ideal, or, you know, we get into situations where it's like, I wouldn't usually do that. Um, so it sounds weird to say the thing I'm about to say, which is that I find people who uh, get caught up in active addiction, they really tend to be very emotionally sensitive people. They usually have a lot of empathy. They usually have um, a lot of elements of care and concern of what other people think. There's just a high degree of emotional sensitivity. Now, that sounds counter to some of the actions people do when they're in active addiction. Yeah. Uh, but I find that one of the biggest risk factors, and this does, you know, trauma will prime the pump for this, yeah. uh, That is, is that we feel overwhelmed. And look at how much people, what lengths they will go to to hide relapse or try to control the access to information so people don't judge them um, or so that they don't hurt their feelings. Like, it's going to hurt your feelings if I know that, if you know that I broke my promise to not use this again. Um, and so I don't want you to know. And certainly there's a self-preservation thing and it's not that it's healthy, but what I'm saying is, you know, when we, we discover that, and I think people, when they try to get in touch with that, it's like, we're trying to dig into something that maybe I was rejecting before I got into addictive behaviors. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now not only am I losing my comfort and protection, I'm digging into vulnerability and maybe hopefully embracing the idea that I'm emotionally sensitive, vulnerable, and vulnerability could be healthy for me, but that's scary, right? Yeah, it is super scary. Um, yeah, that was definitely me too, because like, yes, I was in, in a relationship with someone who was an addict, but I also started to slowly become that as well. And so there's like, there's probably like anywhere from two to four weeks of my, like, I don't have the best memory to begin with, let's be honest, but for sure, there's like two to four weeks of my memory that is absolutely a blank. Um, because of that. And I think once I came to, I was like, you know, I know that that's, this is probably not a rock bottom, but this is as bottom as I ever want to go. And after that, I started just trying to just backtrack from that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do any, any, any worse than that. That was already bad enough. There was weeks where I don't know what I was doing with my life, but I was on an autopilot because I kept doing everything I usually do, but I didn't remember any of it consciously. It was terrible. And mm-hmm. I just realized, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. If this is my rock bottom, that's perfect. I don't want to go any further down than this. Please, no. Um, no, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. I'm a big fan of personalization, too. When people, I think that that phrase, rock bottom, sometimes we're like, oh, did I get, the danger there is we're like, was it bad enough? <laughs> it's like, yeah. then, then we either keep going <laughs> or, yeah, or we feel silly once again. It's like, well, mine yeah. wasn't that bad. And it's like shouldn't we celebrate whatever things happen to guide me or trigger me in a healthy way? You know, uh, hopefully, hopefully yeah. we should. It, a it's win is a win. That. If you, if you notice it, then take it. And congratulations. A lot of people you know, sometimes don't for whatever reason. Um, Did you I also have like a big support network? So that was, that's rare too. Not everybody has a support. And oftentimes that's something people have to seek for and create uh, that they don't always have. I, w- I wondered about that. Did you find there were people in your corner and were you, did you feel open to their feedback and their support at the time? Well, there was a while where I was basically like alienated, because of course, um, I, you know, you, you just kind of can't go out because anytime you go out, it's like you're always being pestered. So after a while, you just, stop talking to people but once I realized I needed to get out of the situation I was in um you know I started going to my family and mentioning and talking it out and realizing oh I am being a knuckle, knucklehead for allowing it to go on that long and it it happens it's unfortunate it took me a long time to to tell myself that was okay because you know you, afterwards 
you know, you kind of beat yourself up for the longest. And it's like, what, what point do you allow yourself to be happy because you realize that you deserve it? You know, for a long time, it's like, I don't, I didn't think I deserved it. Why, mm-hmm. why should I be when I let myself become miserable and deal with all of that? Yeah. It's the labeling after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we go, we go, oh, I, that's when I was being stupid or that's when I was being whatever, instead of like I was struggling with a real health issue and self-medication and all of those like well-rounded descriptions everybody's shared today, even just for example, um, they're much more accurate, specifically accurate, I think. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I, um, well, I, I'm, I'm, uh getting into you know we're 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 down to like our last 10 minutes of this and i'm really yes. grateful to have you uh to to have somebody i've had i've been grateful to have somebody with me this whole time i'm grateful to have to have you on as well and i want to touch on a couple of things that are going to be upcoming uh with some of this work but first of all i wanted to um well gosh first of all there's a few things that i want to do and maybe you can help <laughs> I, I'll, I'll try my best Let me, um, I'm gonna, I wanted to throw out a couple of different things for people that I think are, are helpful. Um, I wanted to do, 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 I'm going to share a little picture here. Um, there's a couple of things. I know that people have different experiences when it comes to like, once again, 12 steps, we've talked about that. And I talk a lot on the show about pros and cons. One of the big pros is the availability. So if you go online, you can even just Google, but there's narcotics.com if you have a more of a drug issue and there's aa.org okay. um, for, for so Narcotics Anonymous, Alcohol Anonymous. Those are the most commonly uh, known 12-step programs. And the availability and that they're free, as are a couple of other resources. So those are a couple of things. I don't know. Did you have any exposure, experience with 12-step communities? No, I haven't. Yeah. And a lot of people don't, that's also another misconception is people say, well, if you have an addiction issue, you have to. And a lot of people find that that actually, for, you know, do, either doesn't work for them uh, for whatever reason uh, or something else kind of works uh, better. So um, another resource. So, so basically you can go on there and the nice thing is you can search up your city and you can find out uh, when are the, and you'll oftentimes find multiple uh, meetings that you might have even on. I noticed when I, I was practicing with the search that uh, many of these also turn up same day. It's like, it's today, here's five things you can go to depending where you are. Um, and you can find a uh, corresponding 12 step for any type of uh, those things. So what if it doesn't work for you? Let's go to this one, share this tab instead. That's the name of the, that's the button that I pushed. Oh, right. That's the smart thing. You were yeah. About. Yeah. The, the SMRT is what Homer Simpson would call it. Um, but it's SM. ART. Anyway, so smart recovery meetings. If you look that up, um, once again, you just Google it or you can go to the actual, you know, directly to the site. If you're into that kind of thing, go to meetings.smartrecovery.org um, and, or just go to smartrecovery.org at all and look up meetings. So the thing about smart is smart is actually based on cognitive behavioral and rational emotive behavioral therapy. And there's a couple of key differences. They uh, they do not, they're not exclusive. They don't care, uh, you know, if you go anywhere else, you could be in 12 steps and benefit from this too. Or if 12 steps don't work for you, you might find this to be a little more health, uh, helpful for you. Um, don't give up if 12 steps don't work for you, in other words. But basically one of their differences is they try to use um, kind of like therapy-based, psychology-based interventions so their support groups are still free. They're a nonprofit organization. Um, and you can find many. I was looking up a couple different cities there. There are a lot more around. You, you know, we think, oh, it's only 12 steps. Uh, but they they kind of embrace that. So they have a little bit more structure. They have a little bit different expectations. Um, but there's a couple of things like whether or not you feel like you want to call yourself an alcoholic or an addict. They don't uh, tell you to do that. Whereas you are in a 12 step group. And if you won't do that, that's kind of a problem in their <laughs> the way that they look at it. Um, so they don't require labeling. They're also sort of, uh, agnostic, so to speak towards the idea of whether or not addiction is classified as a disease or whether or not it's just something that is attendant to a mental health condition or all of those things. They're not going to make you believe one or the other on that either. If, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and so basically there, there's that. Uh, also, for those who find the 12-step approach to be a little too religious-y for them, uh, the, this, this kind of an approach might be helpful uh, for them as well. And yeah, uh, so let's I see. I think that was probably my thing with the 12 step because anything I'd ever seen, it was like over overly religious and I stepped away from, from that. So it just didn't identify with me at all. I will say, yes, exactly. And, you know, the core principles of AA are that it, you know, the idea of believing in something bigger than yourself could be your relationship. It could be, you know, anything at all, what well, they use the phrase higher power and depending on how the individual group is run. And that's another thing is if you don't like 12 step, it's worth trying a couple different ones. Uh, Cause they're all, they're very different because they're volunteer led. Okay. But for many of them, when they say higher power, they mean, I mean, people practice as if, you know, they mean God yeah. and that could be difficult if well, that's not what you're looking for. Obviously. Texas, so there's a really like 80 to 90% chance it's going to be Right. That's, that is. And, you know, just once again, speak, yeah, just statistically, it's like it's usually going to be a Judeo-Christian sort of God understanding if you're in the U.S. Uh, most of the time. So, oh, and let me see. I was looking up. There's a lot of different online. There's a couple others I want to hit. Here we go. I I was not familiar until I was doing research for this uh, event. So I'm, I'm familiar with with the pros and cons of 12 Step and Smart. They've both been around a long time. I would definitely say they're worth trying out. Here's one I think looks good. Um, but I haven't learned as much about it yet. Um, the, to do, there's a couple different things about this. So if you can see this, if you're watching, depending on what device you're watching, uh, recovery Dharma is one that is actually based on some of the principles of, uh, uh Buddhism actually, and more Zen kind of stuff. You can go to recovery Dharma.org. And once again, that's a, it's a nonprofit, it's weather.org. And so they actually have meetings as well that you can find. And some of the principles have to do with a general sense of karma. And many people find that from a sense of either spirituality or philosophy that uh, Buddhism is less aggressive maybe than some other religious expectations. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll direct people to, there's a guy named Jer, J-E-R Clark. That's Clark with an E. And I can't, I'm not going to, I can't vouch hundred percent, but I did find him on YouTube. He see, he, he talks about this kind of thing and how recovery Dharma works. And he seems to be pretty sharp. Um, once again, I can, you know, you have to be careful who you endorse online if you don't know them. So yeah. I don't know if, you know, he's going to start red pilling one of his videos. I don't think so though. He seems like a chill, healthy dude. Um, <laughs> speaking of, speaking of dude behavior, right. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to hit one more. We talk a lot about uh, harm reduction, and there's lots of different harm reduction resources out there. Um, so I don't have a ton. I or I'm not going to go into like all of those, but I just want one of the ones that I uh, I know. Kenneth Anderson uh, is is a man who is very dedicated to the idea of harm reduction. And uh, if you go to hams.cc, c is in cat twice. So hams.cc, it's a nonprofit group. They also have a great Facebook uh, uh, support community. And the idea is they are 100% dedicated. He is very dedicated to the harm reduction model, which is he would not tell anyone how to define sobriety or what that means, health recovery. His whole thing, and he mainly has come from a background of, of alcohol use, but um, you can apply the, the support groups I know are very much oriented towards whatever, uh, either drug of choice or addiction of choice. Um, it's got a lot of little thingies there i'm going to go ahead and put us back on because it's flashing too much there he's got some <laughs> changing pictures on his site so you can go there or search out hams uh h-a-m-s uh on on facebook hams addiction or whatever but but harm reduction once again it's the the principle of it is that we don't we don't tell people and in fact he is very open about sharing his own experiences and how structured alcohol use was what get him away from alcohol dependence. He no longer has alcohol dependence, but he's not completely abstinent from alcohol. And in fact, he, he credits that with saving his life from alcohol abuse is that uh, when he tried to abstinence total model as his definition of sobriety, he, he, it caused so many relapse, he almost died. Right. And so this is something he's open about in his book and stuff. So those are all organizations you can kind of look for. Don't give up just because some one thing doesn't work for you. There are other yeah. things. <laughs> so that's something I just I, I kind of wanted to share. Do you find is there anything you 
find to be helpful uh, to people, people you've worked with or yourself? Other, you mentioned community and your your support system and getting involved in activities. What, anything else you'd recommend? Um, not, not that I can think of. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, the, the life coach glad. thing was great because, um, you know, or even it, I'd probably be better going to therapy, which I, I will be working on soon. Um, <laughs> but just that was, you know, start start somewhere. I mean, I, in those same concepts, we're even in like Noom, which is like a not, it's not a, a plug for it or anything, but it's like the a weight, it's not a weight loss, but weight management kind of thing. But it has a lot of the same. Um, like life coach type of lessons that are in there because it's mostly about getting in tune with yourself, learning those emotions. And like with that case, it was more like learning when you're hungry or not, but there are so many different things that are available to you that also you can use within other things. Mm -hmm. Like if, like whether it be food or um, like if you're like, maybe like uh, with the cannabis, which you guys were speaking about earlier, um, you know, things like that. Yeah. And I will say that those are goals too. Yeah. That you can set up when you have a good, uh, you know, sometimes a coach is someone to bounce it off of. And as a therapist, I know that I'm supposed to not like life coaches, but I've had a lot of them on my program and I've found, you know, I've gained a lot of respect for people. I'm just half teasing about that, but, um, but there's a lot who they do some things. Let me put it this way. If you have friends, if you have a life coach, if you have a therapist, if you have a doctor, all of those people will do things for you that the others don't. And they, they will also do things for you. The others will do things for you that they don't. So it's good to keep that in mind and, and you know, and see what you tailor for yourself. I'm a big believer in empowerment, people finding what works, you know, best for them. And so, um, you know, it sounds like philosophically we're on the same, same page there. I appreciate you, you sharing that. Um, so everybody out there, make sure that uh, you don't, uh, you know, don't give up. If you find yourself in a crisis, if you find yourself um, you know, overwhelmed with mental health or addiction, or uh, we've mentioned 988 already on here. 988 is a mental health crisis and suicide hotline for the United States and Canada that you can just dial uh, and, and you can find some resources. Uh, if you are, you know, looking for something you don't know what to do, I, you know, go online and look up some listings of therapists in your area. Most of them, those websites will allow you to shoot an email or they'll have a phone number you can call that either routes to their number or is their number. And um, the, the useful thing about that is even if you're not ready, either you're not ready personally or maybe financially or insurance wise, you know, even if you can't go see that therapist, oftentimes I know I've received general inquiries from the public that are just like, Hey, I'm looking for this. Does this exist? Do you know anything about this? I can't afford therapy, but do you, and I've, you know, I've never not, I don't, I don't think I've ever not answered. I mean, you know, cause that would feel, you know, so to say, oh, well try here, try there. They'll know what's local. Yeah. Oftentimes they'll know what's local in your community. So there's a couple of resources there as well. I think you mentioned that in one of your episodes fairly recently. Oh, well. oh that's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. I did that little, yeah. That little tip thing of looking, looking around and finding. Yeah. Sending uh, emails uh, to just multiple like therapists and, and whatnot. Cause at least one of them might answer. Cause usually, yeah. like you said, they, they want people, they want to help people at the end of the day. Well, um, oh, before I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the wrap up here uh, uh, with, yeah. you know, Isabel and I are going to sign off with everybody. Uh, she's my ending co-host. Uh, but first, before I do that, would you tell people the things you're doing online, the, the podcast and where they can best follow you? Yeah, um, I am part of a network called Rabbit Hole Podcast. And um, so it's, we have uh, rabbitholepodcast.com, which are like it's a lot of different podcasts. So I am part of the first thing around, which is uh, me and uh, my four other, three other co-hosts. We kind of discussed recently deceased celebrities, which has been interesting. I, I, it is kind of fun in a way because it's a, a, a specific person to kind of go into and looking at all of their works has been really interesting because usually I don't I don't want to watch something new if it's kind of weird but having a reason to has always been fun um and then second one which you were a guest on was that's what Asia suit which I kind of have a, a a list of 80 80 movies that I'm going through and so that's been really fun too everything's just been a learning experience and getting to meet you and do all of this has been really great 
Awesome. Yes. No. And that's like, like same for me. I'm always still meeting people that have become an important part of my own personal life and personal community. And, and I I'll say thank you you know to you as well as all those who've supported by being on, like I said, this is a, a five hour thing. I've the third year running and this is the first time I'm, uh, I will say last year had a lot of support and people on as well, but this is the very first time that I've, I've not been alone the whole broadcast. I mean, the whole broadcast, I've had at least one other person on with me and I'm, I appreciate you and, and everybody who has uh, done that. A lot of people liked and shared on social media with the links and stuff and, and those, and there were those who were invited, but unable to join that also uh, sent along some, some things. I, uh, let's see. Oh, and yeah, just so, I mean, anybody watching, just so you know, or if you're listening, everybody on here that there are a few people who scheduled like, oh, I'll be on at this time, but mostly it was people who just said, oh, you know, I'll give it a shot. And they showed up and, and that's really yeah. cool. I really appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so check out, um, you know, for the month of uh, September uh, coming up and I'll hit this one more time. Every month we highlight, um, a charity. There yeah. we go. Uh, a charity of focus on the show. And so this is the, probably the last thing that you're going to hear. Um, oops. The, yeah. This is probably the last thing uh, that you'll hear in August. I should say, uh, if you go to color outside the lines.org, you'll find the organization color outside the lines, which is an organization in California and Oregon that works with uh, uh, youth who have a lot of, uh, you know, basically a lot of risk factors in their lives that put them, uh, puts them at risk for uh, mental health issues and addictions, as well as those in foster care. And they use art and movement and dance uh, to help uh, people to and help the, the young people to process their emotions and things, too. So if you happen, I mean, if you join, if you happen to join the Patreon in the next couple of days, uh, whenever you join our Patreon, you get access to bonus materials and 50% of your monthly donation does go straight to, and that's 50% of whatever Patreon gives me. So, uh, just so you know, they take just a little, little bit, but I, um, well, actually, you know what it's off of, actually it's off of what you put. Cause I've been calculating it. If you donate five, it's two fifty. If you donate 10, it's five. So well, there you go. So it's actually your, your, your gross donation, not my net. Um, not to brag. It's a few more cents. But anyway, uh, but anyway, it's one of the things I look forward to every month is is sending those off to the organization. So it will go as long as you're a paid member, it will go towards the charity that was the highlight when you joined. Uh, next month in September, we're actually going to be looking at uh, Horses of Hope, which is an organization in Puerto Rico that uh, uses equine therapy, which is usually only accessible to those for a lot of cost, but they're nonprofit and, and make it uh, free access to people and to youth to use a uh, equine therapy with horses to, to uh, address their mental health as well. So that will be coming up as well as September is also uh, Batman day annual, the, an annual observance of the anniversary of when Batman was first invented is in September. And so just like last year, planning on some Batman related events, you'll see, I'm going to bring back my uh, Arkham, asylum internship uh where i do some little short videos on social media diagnosing batman characters members of the batman oh, rogues gallery as part of my uh, internship at arkham asylum so are there we you all go. gonna be on top of skyscrapers to brood yes see that's what see we gotta work <laughs> that in we gotta work that in <laughs> so there's some things coming up in september on the podcast and uh you know, for those uh, also share on your social medias, look up International Opioid Overdose Awareness Day. There's an organization, a nonprofit that you that has ways that you can share, not just restricted to this Saturday, but, you know, forward that around. Let people know that this matters. Isabel, thanks for being with me today. Thanks for having me. I mean, not that it was a choice because you had the link live, but yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I could, I, I had to click, I had to click admit from the waiting room. Oh, so oh, I was, okay. yeah, <laughs> totally willing. I could have pretended <laughs> not to, but uh, so, and thanks everybody for being here watching and uh, yeah, make sure be safe, be healthy. Love y'all. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.